Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. I have a little experiment I have set up here. I want to test the performance of these isolating tabs that have cat hair on it. Of course these are used between the heat sink and transistor to electrically isolate the transistor from the heat sink because in many cases we'll have different voltages on the tabs like an audio amplifier one tab could be the positive rail the other tab could be the negative rail and if you just directly attach the transistors to the heat sink you're going to short out the power supply so why in the heck do they make transistors with the tab electrically connected to one of the pins in this case this is a MOSFET and it's connected to the drain on bipolar junction transistors it's connected to the collector well it's all about heat transfer and getting the heat out of the silicon die inside the transistor the way the transistor die is set up they attach that die to the metal tab inside the transistor so we can get as much heat out of that transistor as possible now it is possible to get isolated tab transistors but their thermal conductivity is not going to be as good as the ones that are not electrically isolated. Now there's four common ways to attach a transistor to the heat sink. One way is of course is just to directly attach it with no isolation. That would give you the best thermal performance. But if you want isolation you have to use one of these materials. One isolating pad is the mica washer that I have here. This here is a sill pad or silicone pad. It's made primarily out of silicone and there's probably other materials embedded in it to help with the thermal conductivity. And there's Captain Tape, which I don't have. I'm going to substitute a piece of mylar here. I've got to cut it down to the same size and shape and I'll use that. From the information I found, Mylar has actually slightly better thermal conductivity, so you know, I'll just go ahead and use that since I don't have the Captain type material. Which you see that material used in flexible circuit boards, and like I say, they also use it in these thermal pads. And it's kind of a orangish color material. And what's interesting is that these thermal pads are not very thermally conductive actually these materials are not very good at conducting heat well one reason for that is materials that are electrically non-conductive tend not to be very thermally conductive and that's not true in all cases but you know inexpensive materials that are easy to use for these thermal pads are not very thermal conductive one way of rating the thermal conductivity of a material is in watts per meter Kelvin. And for example, this aluminum material of this heat sink is rated at 237 watts per meter Kelvin. The copper that they use in the transistor pads is 400 watts per meter Kelvin. Now you might say, that's not copper. Well, it actually is. It's just plated. If you sanded this down, you would see that it is copper. And they, they use copper because it's of its much better thermal conductivity to get the heat out of the die and spread it out into the transistor tab so it could be conducted away when mounted on a heat sink. I looked up some values of these materials and mica is only 0.71 watts per meter Kelvin. That's a huge difference, isn't it? The sill pad is actually more. It's 3.5 to 0.9 from one manufacturer's website and Captain is 0.12 this Mylar is slightly better at 0.14 now eh, they're pretty close though so why do we use such poor thermal conductors well like I said it has to do with the cost of the materials and you know making them in this shape for example diamond is an excellent conductor of heat at 1,000 watts per meter Kelvin, it would be ideal, but think of the expense and, you know, making it into this shape. You know, diamond's not real easy to cut, and it's not real cheap either. But there's a lot more than meets the eye. To get heat transferred involves three things. 
like I said, involves the thermal conductivity of the materials itself, and it also includes the area through which the heat has to transfer and the thickness. These are very thin materials, so heat is going to go through them pretty easy. Okay, so I have this circuit set up here consisting of this MOSFET, some IRFZ44. Doesn't really matter, I could use different MOSFET or even a bipolar transistor. I'm going to put one amp through it and set it so there's 15 volts across that. So there'll be a dissipation of 15 watts. And what I'll do is try the different thermal pads and even directly mounted. I use my meter here with this low mass thermal probe. Dab a little heat sink compound on its metal tab and just hold the probe on there. Apply power. Run the test for 15 seconds and see the temperature rise. Why 15 seconds? That should be good enough to get the transistor warm and get some good measurements. I don't want to run it so long that I heat this heat sink up because then I got to cool it back down and do the next part and it just take a while. If I run it for 15 seconds it's not going to heat this heat sink up very much at all. It's only 225 joules so it's you know 15 watts at 15 seconds and you know that kind of energy is not going to warm this heat sink up much. It'll still have to cool down between uh, tests, but it'll be good enough. And here is the schematic of the circuit. It's just the meter here. I'm using my power supplies current meter. I'll put 16 volts across this circuit. I'll be losing about a volt in this resistor here. This is in the source, so it helps with the stability of the circuit because as this heats up, it's going to want to conduct more, throw off the test. And I'm using a potentiometer here to, so I can adjust and you know, set it for one amp. This resistor here is called a gate stopper, and it's put close to the gate as possible. Its purpose is to prevent the circuit from oscillating. Because in another test, when I was testing my Radio Shack power supply using a similar circuit, I was actually causing the transistor to oscillate. And putting in this resistor here will prevent that from happening. I don't want to go into too much depth of how that works, but you know, there's parasitics in this circuit and uh, it can oscillate. Okay, my first problem encountered with this circuit was, well, I fired it up and the thermal stability was awful. It was very touchy to adjust, and as soon as I power it up, the current starts climbing pretty quickly. Well, it turns out the source resistor I had is supposed to be 1 ohm, and I actually had a 0.1 ohm, so I misread the resistor, had the wrong value in there. Well, I couldn't find a 1 ohm, so I put two 0.47s in series, and that's close enough. Thermal stability is much better now, and I will get this meter going. Okay, meter set up, 67 degrees Fahrenheit. I have the furnace off because I don't like the noise in the background when I'm shooting a video. So I'll touch this on here and time it out for 15 seconds. I need to get a stopwatch. Okay, got a little heat sink compound on there. I'll touch it right on the tab and let it stabilize. It says it's 69. That's our starting temp. And I'm going to have to switch hands here because I got to hit the stopwatch and hit the power on. The power supply at about the same time and here we go we look at that temperature shoot up and 
stop. 174 it looks like. Boy, the current is nice and stable. So we had a temperature rise of 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty significant, really. That thing was really shooting up. So now I'll switch to the mica isolator and see how that goes. Okay, I greased up both sides. Very important to do both sides of the mica insulator with this lovely Radio Shack heatsink compound. And I'll do the test again, you know, same test. I'll do the mylar and I'll do a direct mount on the heat sink and come back with the results. Stay tuned. And the results are in. Drum roll, please. Here we go. Here are the materials and, of course, direct on the heat sink. Starting temperatures, finishing temperatures. This is delta T, change in temperatures. This side or left side of the slash Fahrenheit, and I also did converted to Celsius for people who might want to know that. So the sill pad had a delta T of 105 or 58.3 degrees Celsius. As you can see, pretty horrible performance. The mica did very well. 52 degrees, 28.9 in Celsius. Against the Mylar, which was 75 or 41.7. Now the mica I measured with my micrometer was 2.5 mils thick, um, which is thousandths of an inch. Uh, you'll have, you'd have to convert that to millimeters if you want. The Mylar is 2 mils, so it does have a thinner advantage for conducting heat. However, like I said, the uh, I have it written down here, the mica is 0.71 watts per meter Kelvin, whereas the mylar is much, much lower, 0.14. So that's why the mica did much better. And carrying on here, not surprising, direct on the heat sink did extremely well. Only 20 degrees delta T, which is 11.1 .1 in Celsius. So yeah, mounting the transistor direct to the heat sink without any isolation certainly gives you a much better thermal conducting performance of getting the uh, you know the heat out of that transistor. But like I say, uh, you can't always directly mount without electrical isolation problems. Well, that was a pretty interesting test. I'm glad I run it. Not really surprised at any of these results, but it was interesting to do, and hopefully you were interested in the results as well. That's it. Thanks for watching.